Okay. Back to this screen share. Okay, so again, before we get started, we just wanted to take a moment to remember Tom Merriman. Tom um, was a co-founder of Butterfly Farms, who's also a member of the Pollinator Alliance, who sadly lost his life at the start of this year. Tom was well known locally for being an expert on butterfly health and milkweed, and has contributed so much to pollinator conservation in San Diego County and beyond. And we remember Tom for being so dedicated to butterfly conservation and for his willingness of sh to share his knowledge and his love of helping others to learn more about supporting butterflies. Okay, so just a, a quick um, intro to the Pollinator Alliance. Again, um, this network is hosting this workshop series. We're a network of agencies and organizations that are working together to support pollinator health. We've been doing this since 2016 when this group formed to address uh, declines in pollinator populations. And we really aim to help people create good habitat for pollinators um, on all sorts of scales, you know, small and large scale on public and private lands from home gardens to restoration projects and everything in between. Some of our projects include a yearly exhibit at the San Diego County Fairgrounds. You can see a picture of that at the bottom right corner of the screen. And you may have visited that exhibit before. We unfortunately weren't able to do it in 2020 for obvious reasons, but we hope to be able to resume that soon. And we've also created some demonstration pollinator gardens across the county at schools and in public spaces. And the purpose of those is to educate and inspire other people to, to recreate that at home. We're working on some resources to help people create pollinator habitat, including a pollinator toolkit, as well as workshops like this. And um, a big project that we're, we're working on right now is to create a seed and plant source of local native milkweed. Milkweed being the host plant for monarch butterflies. It's the only plant that monarch caterpillars can eat and without milkweed, they would have no monarchs. Now this slide shows the current members of the San Diego Pollinator Alliance. Um, the only logo that is missing there is the San Diego Zoo, who has just recently officially joined the Alliance, but we've been working together with them for quite a long time. Ready? So, um, thank you. <laughs> for whatever reason, my slide is not advancing. I'll go ahead and try and do that poll yeah. again, Anne. Oh, um, cool. I think I see how to do it there. Thank you. All right. Uh, just to get a little bit of a sense of, of who's with us today, we'll uh, send out a poll here. It's, do you have a pollinator garden? And uh, maybe at the next workshop, we'll, we'll ask some more details. But um, you know, if we were at the fairgrounds or at uh, Sky Mountain Permaculture, we'd be getting to know each other a little bit. Um, so if you want to in the chat, um, after you answer the poll, um, maybe just uh, if you have, if you want to chat anything in about your pollinator garden or um, um, maybe what area of the, of the, County, or if you're just in another part of Southern California, maybe uh, where you're joining us from today. We'll kind of get a little bit of interactivity going here. So we have our friend with the Yorba Linda Butterfly Society up in uh, Yorba Linda, joining us from Orange County. So good to see you, Christina. Let's see, how's our poll doing? Looks like we've got uh, just about everybody in. 41% uh, of you do have pollinator gardens and 59%, uh, 56%. All right, about half and half. So hopefully we will uh, provide some information that is useful to all of you. We've got, looks like some people 
tapping in where they're from. Someone joining us from East County, Oceanside, um, over in Golden Hill, down in San Diego, another San Diego in North Park, out in San Carlos, super. La Jolla. Well, one also, thing that's nice about these okay. workshops is, uh, you know, sometimes we just reach the people that are near to where we um, are doing the workshop, but in the virtual world, we, we can reach out a little bit further and, um, you know, folks don't have to take the time to drive to the site, but, um, and we hope that also you guys are able to share this information with your friends. We'll, we'll be uh, doing these workshops on the 10th and the 24th of next month as well. So, all right, Anne, well, thanks for answering the chat and thanks for chiming in there in the uh, chat. It's great to see so many people here with us today. So I'll hand it back to you, Anne. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. That's really cool to see how many people are from all over the county. And, you know, just to reiterate, these kind of gardens can happen on any scale, you know, from a small patio garden to a large, you know, backyard or other space. So really hope that we can help you all put some pollinator habit habitat in no matter what um, amount of space that you have. So we're all here, we're all interested in creating pollinator habitat, but why is this so important? Well, you may have recently heard that the monarch population, especially the, the Western monarch population, so these are the butterflies that we see, is at an all time low. Uh, the Western monarch is monitored each year through an effort called the Thanksgiving Count, where volunteers observe monarchs that are overwintering at California at sites along the California coast. Well, this year, um, just a couple of months ago, an uh, all-time low of monarchs was recorded. That was less than 2,000 monarch butterflies. That's down from around 30,000 butterflies just last year and um, represents about, well, less than 1% of the historic population of monarchs seen at overwinter overwintering sites, which would have been upwards of a million, you know, back in the mid 90s. So this is really um, quite stark and startling. And it's not just monarchs that are experiencing decline in their population. Many other pollinating insects are as well. Um, native bees, many species of, species of them are at risk of extinction. Even honeybees are seeing declines. Beekeepers are, are noting um, a loss of about 30% of their bees each year. And other species of butterflies as well, about 19% of butterflies are at risk of extinction. So um, there, you know, there is a lot, uh, a lot of challenges that pollinators are facing. But we do need pollinators. They deliver many essential services that benefit us and the world around us. Um, one, one thing that they obviously do for us is help produce the food that we eat. It's thought that about one in every three bites of food comes um, to us via pollinators. You may have seen this picture on the bottom of the screen before. This was something done by Whole Foods. On the left-hand side, you, would, you see a produce section from a supermarket in normal times. Well, in a world without bees and other pollinators, the produce section would look a lot more like the picture on the right, where there is a lot less choice. So the foods that we eat would be a lot less diverse, and it would be a lot harder to get the nutrition that we need um, as well. And it's not just diversity in the food that we eat that would be disrupted, but also the diversity in our landscapes. Around 85% of the world's flowering plants rely on pollinators for reproduction. So without them, the landscape would look a lot different. Pollinators also help create food for other animals. Many animals rely on the seeds and fruits that are produced through pollination. So those animals' food sources would be impacted and generally a loss of pollinators would just have you know, far ranging impacts um, across many ecosystems. So why is this happening? Well, habitat loss and pesticide use are two major reasons along with climate change and diseases. If you want to learn more about pollinators and the, if, and the issues impacting them, um, the Xerces Society has a lot of really helpful information. Um, there's a link here, but we'll pop it into the chat as well. So now I'm going to hand you over to Jonathan, who's going to take you through um, more information about what pollinator habitat is and how we can start building that in the spaces that we use. Super. Well, I have done a couple of presentations on Zoom, but this is my first time to teach a workshop, so um, we'll see how that goes. Um, okay, well, um, as Anne introduced me in the beginning of the 
presentation. My name is Jonathan Snapcook, and I am a biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I work out of our Carlsbad Fish and Wildlife Office. We have about um, uh, 60 biologists that work in that office, as well as our support staff, who are just as important to the work that we do. And sometimes uh, some of that support staff is able to get out to the um, Del Mar Fair with me and, and help me out at our exhibit. So we really appreciate everybody who works in our office and who helps us do this type of work. Um, the first few slides I'm going to show are just some pictures of our pollinator garden at the fair. Then I have a um, picture of our one of our pollinator gardens at a local school here in Encinitas. And um, we'll go ahead and uh, then get into the nuts and the bolts of creating a pollinator habitat at your home or business or church or wherever you decide to do. Um, the pollinator garden that we did at the San Diego County Fair is definitely a collaboration between all the members of the um, partnership. Um, kind of our showpiece item is um, really the effort of butterfly farms. And if you want to visit a similar flight house to the one pictured here, uh, they're open during the quarantine up here in Encinitas um, along Saxony by the uh, Magdalena Ecke YMCA across the street there at the, um, what is that called? The um, Lichtschig Foundation. So they are currently open. You can visit them and uh, see the butterflies that they have in their flight house. And you can also buy um, plants there for your pollinator garden. Uh, also, we you know, support other native plant nurseries such as uh, Native West and Musa Creek. So we got a lot of good places to buy native plants in our county. Go to the next slide. Um, just another picture of the uh, butterfly house there. And uh, like Christina and Yorba Linda mentioned, uh, once you build your habitat for pollinators and monarchs, you can register it as a monarch way station. So that's an example of a sign that you can get, just kind of a way to show off uh, what you've done and also have it counted in the overall effort for this type of work. Next slide. Uh, just some close-ups there. Our monarch, the little uh, milkweed garden that we had that was kind of set apart from some of our um, more diverse parts of the garden. And then um, a nice Fish and Wildlife Service poster that was, you know, just to get people thinking about how they can help with the monarch conservation. All right, next. Okay, this is a uh, pollinator garden, sort of uh, mid-season at our um, at one of the elementary schools that we work with. Um, you know, a lot of times when I'm thinking about what are the, our hurdles to getting people to um, do pollinator gardens, sometimes they look a little bit wild, um, but through signage and other features such as the boulders or the arbor, you know, a lot of times you can still make them um, appealing during this um, time of the year. This is probably one of my uh, before maintenance pictures or something. All right, next slide. Um, so we're gonna kind of start with the fun part, um, you know, planning your pollinator garden. Uh, one of the, the things that we've found is both helpful to kind of raise awareness, but also to get the creative juices flowing is to focus on um, planning our gardens. And, you know, you can learn a lot while you're doing this. And also it's free. So next slide. All right, so an important place to start is knowing what is a pollinator garden or pollinator habitat. There's a lot of words on this slide, but the three important things are uh, food, water, and shelter. Just like for any animal, we want to make a place where they feel comfortable and at home. So um, we're kind of breaking that down in our three um, components of food, water, and shelter. Um, and having a good supply and, and a diversity of food, water, and shelter then that will attract a wide range of pollinators, including uh, different types of butterflies. Uh, probably what we're missing on this slide uh, related to butterflies is uh, talking about host plants, um, but we can get more into that later. 
that's the um, plant like a milkweed where monarch lay their eggs on a specific host plants. All butterflies or many butterflies have specific plants that you can plant and that will attract different butterflies. Uh, so of course with the food, mostly what we're talking about here is flowers, which provide nectar and pollen to the pollinators. And as a byproduct of that attraction, those pollinators then fly to another similar plant and transfer the pollinator, the pollination, which is the key to the whole puzzle here. Um, thinking about your plant choice, you wanna do a diversity of plants. We're gonna go into all these aspects a little bit more detail. It's just kind of the overview. Uh, having flowers of different colors, fragrances, bloom shapes, uh, that'll provide pollen and nectar throughout the growing season. Uh, with water, uh, you know, you don't need a lot of water. Not, I mean, having a bird bath can also help, but, you know, a lot of times for pollinators, we're talking about having just a little um, bit of mud in your garden or a little dish that you might refill each day, but a shallow source of a shallow source of clean water um, can help to support and attract pollinators to your garden. Um, shelter, you know, a lot of what we do traditionally in gardens is we deadhead our plants, we make sure that the ground is clean. And what you wanna do in a pollinator garden is find a way to leave a little bit of this diversity. You don't have to leave all of your dead blooms on there, but sometimes if there's stuff that's out of the way or not, on the front row where you want it to be most uh, pretty, you can leave the old flower blooms or you can pile um, you know, your, your leaves. Those provide a good place for some insects to make a home. Uh, there also are bee houses and bug boxes that you might uh, purchase or construct. You can also just take a log and drill different sized holes in it just to kind of increase that diversity of places where um, insects are gonna be able to lay there eggs or, and their larvae are going to be able to develop. Um, we didn't put a lot of resources into this presentation, but one book that comes to mind uh, that if you haven't read or you haven't seen the presentations on YouTube is uh, Doug Ptolemy's uh, Bringing Nature Home. And uh, maybe, Anne, if you have a chance, you can chat that uh, title of that book in there. I think that's a great one to get uh, thinking about some of the benefits of, of having a diverse habitat. Next slide. The other thing that we promote in all of our habitat gardens are um, using California natives. This slide just goes through a few of the reasons. Uh, first of all, having native plants from your local area is a benefit because they're already adapted to the soils and weather that you will experience in your area. Secondly, the native plants have evolved with the native pollinators. So they already have the components of food, water, shelter sort of built into them. Typically, we think of native plants as using less water than our grass shrub landscapes that are common in Southern California, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean no water. You still wanna think about keeping your soils moist during the spring and early summer. So you just wanna be keeping an eye on that. And if you have a plant that looks thirsty before it would naturally be going dormant, um, you probably wanna give it a little bit of water. Also, uh, we recommend during the first year after you've planted to kind of go ahead and water it throughout that year. Uh, the sort of hazard with giving your plants uh, water in the late summer and the fall is that sometimes our hot temperatures can cause uh, funguses and root rots to develop when we're watering in that time of year when we don't naturally have water. Another way to uh, kind of see what native plants might be good in your area is to take a hike at a um, nature park or an open space area near where you live and just take notes or take photos of plants that you think are nice. Next slide. I'm so happy to see you. All right. Wow. Let's see, um, we're gonna get now down into the nuts and bolts. So I just wanna take a pause and see if anybody has any questions that they'd like to uh, chat in or um, we'll pause here for a minute. So if you want, if you'd prefer to unmute yourself and ask a question, um, 
we'll sort of take a, a minute or two just for a couple of questions. one friend who does teach workshops a lot and she always jokes um, that it's hard to read the Zoom room. So I, I'm hoping that you're all just staring at your computer screens with rapt attention. Um, Jonathan, I have, have a question here from in? Monica. Yeah, there's sure. a question here from Monica. She says uh, she's asking to prevent fungus, what do you suggest or is there a safe way to treat it? So, um, you know, that's something that I'm more um, experienced with of just having heard it at native plant um, gardening lectures. So I don't really, other than not watering during the dry time of the year, um, I don't have a lot of input about that. The other type of fungus we've seen, which I don't think it directly affects the plants is a lot of times with the mulch that we recommend, which is a gorilla hair mulch which is kind of a shredded redwood bark. We use that in a lot of our uh, gardens to keep the ground covered. Um, we've noticed that sometimes a white fungus will start growing on the surface as that um, matting like breaks down. And I don't think that that's, tip that's very detrimental to the plants, but um, you know, uh, this reminds me that the California Native Plant Society, at least before the um, quarantine, and the San Diego chapter is one of our Pollinator Alliance members, um, was offering a um, kind of intro to gardening with native plants from 6.30 to 7.30 before their meetings. I don't know if they're doing that online right now, but definitely once the um, danger with COVID is, is past us, uh, that's a great place to get troubleshooting advice for a, a novice native plant grower. Great, um, there's another question here um, asking if we will be providing any suggestions for San Diego stores that carry uh, native plants. Sure. Um, we... Oh, and Mary's uh, responded actually with a few ideas. And there's um, also a, suggesting... oh, go ahead, Anne. Uh, um, unless you have anything to add, we have Musa Creek, Native West Nursery, and Butterfly Farms are great resources. And I think Musa Creek also can, um, many, they support many garden centers. You can place orders and then have them delivered to those participating garden centers. And then also uh, Ryan from Native West uh, said that we could give out his email and if people have like a wish list. They don't have, I don't think, a retail location, but he said he'd be happy to get help people get um, plants for their pollinator garden. And then Sue at Musa Creek has a pollinator pack that you can order that has 32 uh, two inch plants in it uh, for about 110 or $120. Um, there is a website at the San Diego Native Plant Society that has a list of places that you can buy native plants also. And um, after I get done with my part of the presentation, I can paste that link in. Any great. other questions, Anne? Jonathan, yeah, um, there was another question um, from Annie here about where you might find Gorilla Mulch. So I know you can get it uh, shredded redwood. Um, I bought it at Armstrong Garden Center. I know also at, uh, at the city of Oceanside, they have a, um, I don't know exactly what it is. It's not exactly their dump, but it's connected with their um, sort of waste center. Uh, they do different types of mulch there. And there's a type called uh, orchard mulch that is sort of a, a rough and tumble mulch, but uh, we've used that in some situations and that's good. Uh, when you're buying mulch from the um, kind of recycling places where they take the green waste in, um, I just recommend like checking it out before you get a whole truckload of it because sometimes they do have a little bit of trash mixed in with it. But um, some of those places where they collect your green waste do provide mulch, uh, and I know Oceanside does. Um, There was one other question, um, whether there is a list of non-native plants that would be optimum uh, for pollinators. 
Uh, at our next workshop on March 10th, or we haven't exactly juggled out the um, presenters, but um, there's a woman who works for the UC uh, Extension named Annika Neighbors, who's gonna talk about what makes different plants attractive to pollinators. And I think she's gonna cover that. Uh, she was gonna be on the 10th, but I think we're juggling some schedules around. So she might be on the 24th, but um, one resource that really has gone into that question is the UC Berkeley um, B lab. So if you type in UC Berkeley B lab, um, there's a nice uh, resource there and they've looked at different gardens and kind of how um, both native and non-native plants attract pollinators. But it's the same idea, a diversity of, of flower sizes and shapes um, and trying to spread that blooming time throughout your year. All right, let's get back into the, uh, into the nuts and bolts here. With your registration, you should have gotten a packet um, that has a few worksheets in it. I think that maybe we can either, can we put an attachment into the chat, Anne? Attach a file. If you wanna put that PDF up there, just in case people didn't get it, they could download it. Um, yeah, let me try doing that. And if you could switch to the next slide. <laughs> Sorry, I'm asking you to do yeah, that. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right, so getting into the handouts, um, and I think you have a little dialogue box, must be covering the corner of the slides there too, it looks like. Now I'm asking you to do three things at once. So. Oh my goodness, All right. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> I made this little uh, graphic so that we can think about what the different steps of making a pollinator garden are. Uh, first, of course, you need to choose a location so you have something to work with. Secondly, you kind of choose your plants as we've been talking about. Uh, third, you would prepare your space. Fourth, you would plant your garden. And then after your garden is planted, you're gonna water it, you're gonna watch it, and you're gonna weed it. So um, today we're gonna cover these first two, choose a location and choose your plants. And then after I'm done speaking, um, Mary is gonna talk specifically about uh, growing milkweed um, and mostly from squeeze seed. And so that is just to cover our uh, monarch conservation part of the workshop. Um, all the sort of uh, ideas about pollinator gardening kind of apply to uh, monarch gardening because the monarchs not only need the milkweed to grow and feed on, but um, having a diverse uh, floral arrangement in your yard will also support the monarch butterflies. So um, that's kind of how they go together. All right, so when you're thinking about where you want to put your pollinator garden, what you want to do is think about your area that you have to work with. And so this might be your yard, it might be that you want to uh, help a local school to put in a pollinator habitat, or it might be that you want to work with a, um, you know, at your church or some other kind of uh, semi-public place. Um, what I did here is kind of get some ideas down on, on paper so that you can start to think about when you're when you've kind of zeroed in on your general location, okay, I'm gonna do this in my front yard, uh, then what you wanna kind of think about and make notes to yourself about, and here in the middle, um, observe and make a map is always a fun thing to start with. You can either make a, a large scale map or a small scale map, you know, zoomed in or zoomed out. Um, and, and, you know, maybe you wanna make one of your whole yard for starters, and sort of note some different conditions. You know, where in your yard do you have sun? Where do you have shade? Where do you have like a shadow of a big tree that crosses throughout the day? Um, this information is important because as you go to choose your plants, the plants might have a note of this plant enjoys full sun, this plant enjoys a moist, shady area. The next thing you want to think about is your soils. Um, there is, um, a couple of different ways to determine what type of soil you have, but the method that I like to use is sort of the um, 
Okay, so you take your hand and you get some of your soil and you put it in your hand, you put some water on it, and then you mash it and you try to feed it out through this uh, area of your thumb and finger. If it falls apart, your soil is more in that uh, sandy condition. And if you're able to sort of make a snake that kind of stays together, then you're more on the edge of the clay soils. Sandy soils tend to be well drained and clay soils might hold water for a longer time and have less drainage. Um, you know, both of those are good to note, but um, again, in terms of what plant you're choosing, um, the plants that we have in our list tend to like sort of moderately drained soils. Um, and we do have the plant list that we typically use in our pollinator gardens attached. But, you know, there's about 3,500 different native plants in San Diego County, and different ones do better towards the coast, the foothills, the mountains, and the desert. So you want to kind of keep in mind your local conditions and then um, make your plant choice based on that. A lot of times, even though we have 3,500 plants that are native to our county, you know, at a native plant nursery, you're only going to have about a choice from about 50 plants. Um, and what you want to ask about if the person who runs the nursery is knowledgeable, once you have that map of your backyard or your front yard, um, you want to ask, oh, does this one do good in well-drained soils? Will this do okay in clay soils? And, um, like I said, we're going to talk more about site prep, uh, next week or the week after next on the 10th. Um, but there are things you can do to kind of augment your clay soils. Um, a lot of times we build a type of bed called Google culture. Maybe Anne, you could type that in so people could Google it. Google Google culture. Um, we have fun doing that. It's often a good um, kind of prepping thing. And then also just to get your um, kind of brainstorming going, I kind of wrote different types of gardens that we might do here in San Diego, there's, uh, I think this is my method of my yard, squeezing it in, I rent, and so I haven't been able to rip out my uh, grass. So I have just squeezed my pollinator garden in on my patio, and I have about a foot of dirt between the fence and the, uh, the bricks back there where I've squeezed in about 10 different types of native plants. Um, there's the new backyard, you know, you move into a, a new house and you either have landscape you don't like or a blank slate to work with. And that really gives you a, uh, a lot of room to work with, but you know, you might still want to start in a small area to see what's um, doing okay. Um, you might have a shady corner or a sunny corner where, you know, the grass that's in the main part of your yard isn't doing well. So you want to kind of build a border and then put in a different type of uh, garden there, a pollinator garden. So there you might have a decent amount of space to work with, but it might have either, you know, full sun or full shade. Um, you know, a lot of times our side yards are just sort of a, so a storage area. And that's a place where you can put planter boxes in along the edge, or you can do containers. And then of course, a few people are lucky enough to have a large rural yard where um, you can really do um, a lot. And, uh, you know, sometimes we have workshops at Alden's place, which is called Sky Mountain Permaculture Institute. He's got about six acres and he has just packed every square inch of his uh, property with different pollinator plants, as well as hugo culture and uh, bioswells. And uh, we always have a fun time teaching workshops there. Um, other San Diego situations you might encounter, uh, you know, a lot of people, our houses are just built straight on the clay. That's tricky. Uh, a lot of people have the edges of hillsides in their backyards. Uh, that's a little tricky. And then, of course, there's becoming uh, used to our highly variable precipitation, um, which just takes a little bit of planning in order to work with. But uh, if you use native plants, a lot of times they are already used to that. Um, I was, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit more about this handout here. 
Um, I see I have one question. How can you tell which would be better inland versus coast on our plant list? Uh, I think on the next slide, I'm going to talk about plant choice. So if, uh, if you're okay with it, I'll just save that question till the next slide. Um, so the handout, if, and if you could kind of circle your mouse around the handout there and talk about, as I talk about these different areas. So of course, in the blank area, that's where you get to map. Um, in the legend there with uh, I have basically three columns, a symbol, a plant, and a size. Uh, the symbol, you get to use your own creativity. You can do, you know, square, triangle, uh, circle, but um, before long, you kind of run out of shapes. So then a lot of times you have to put, you know, um, a colored in triangle is this plant or a, um, a, uh, a circle with an asterisk in it is this plant. And I think, um, and if you can just go back two slides or three slides to that color uh, drawing that one of our partners did. Yeah, you can see here are three different kind of methods, but um, we have one landscape architect that just used sort of um, blobs with different letters in them. Another one that used different colors and a few different symbols um, in the colorful drawing. And then um, another partner that used Google Earth to uh, mark up the aerial uh, image of their uh, area that they were landscaping. All right, you can go ahead and click uh, forward back to that one. So uh, what I would like you to do in between this workshop and the next workshop is um, do those observations and um, make a map of both your sort of zoomed out area. So you can kind of mark where you have sun, where you have shade, where you have sandy soils, and then um, just have some fun with it and try, uh, you know, drawing a pollinator garden. In. A lot of times we're making um, humps or hills in our gardens by piling soil, or we're doing uh, squiggly edges and all of those things kind of uh, contribute to the interest Okay, next slide. All right, so I have two slides on choosing your plants. Um, going back to thinking about uh, what attracts a pollinator and that food, water, shelter, really the most important thing that we're trying to differentiate in a pollinator garden versus another garden is just thinking about it from that pollinator's perspective and um, thinking about what's gonna bring them in. And of course, they're looking for food, which is pollen and nectar. And so as you, um, as you work on your plant choice, what you can do is put down the name of your plant on this chart. And again, if you want to circle kind of around these areas on the handout, uh, you know, list your plants. Uh, it's good to put down the size because of course, when you buy them from the nursery, they're all going to be in, you know, one gallon plants or five gallon pots. And, um, you know, they're not super expensive, but they're not inexpensive. So you don't want to waste your money. So what I recommend is, um, not over pot, over planting your space and think about the size that the plant's going to grow to as it matures. So the first couple of years, your garden might look a little bit um, vacant, but as the plants grow in, it'll, it'll fill those spaces. And if you have plants that die, you can always replace them. That way you're not uh, spending a ton of money and, and causing a lot of crowding in your garden. But then, um, what you want to do is look up on a chart and for the species that we have, and I think also um, hopefully on calscape.org, which we kind of recommend as a place to learn a lot about plants, they will tell you what time of year it um, blooms. And so, um, and if you kind of circle your um, mouse there in those months of the year, you just fill in what months it's blooming. And then at the end, after you put your 10 or 20 plants down, you'd see like, do I have, are all my plants going to bloom in March, April, May, and I'm not going to have any plants blooming in July, August, September. Um, 
you know, that's how you want to use this chart is to kind of, and you know what, you can also put in the plants that you currently have in your yard. And if you don't know their name, you can make up a name for them. You know, the, uh, the plant that has yellow flowers and sharp leaves. Um, and that way you can mark down the plants that you already have existing in your yard and just see where you need to uh, focus in order to extend that blooming period for your pollinators. Okay, next slide. All right, and this is the plant list that we have alluded to. Um, it being black and white and not having beautiful pictures of, uh, of all these nice plants is a little bit boring, but I guarantee it before long, you will be talking about uh, Dedulus edulis and uh, Lonicera subspeciaria. You know, just be rolling off your tongue and, and you'll know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> but at the first blast, uh, you know, a bunch of Latin names is a little bit, uh, is a little bit wild. But on this chart, you can see we have the botanical name, the common name. Um, the great thing about the digital age we live in is you can uh, get iNaturalist for your phone. You can take pictures of plants. It will give you suggestions as to what they are. Um, you know, there's a lot of digital resources where you can see what these plants look like. Uh, there also is a great um, print resource, um, and it also gets towards answering that question about which ones are better for the coast and the inland. So um, I will paste in the link to a couple of the um, plant guides, plants for pollinators, um, and I will um, I'll get that out to you once I hand it over to Mary. It also has the size that the plants tend to grow to, um, the color of the blooms. Again, uh, you know, you can find some stuff about which different types of insects like um, specific colors, but, um, you know, we recommend just having a kind of a diversity of these different colors. And then there's the bloom season, which you need to fill in the, um, fill in that chart. Um, I just put down some things to kind of think about as you're choosing your plants. Uh, the right plants from my location, which uh, Calscape is good at providing a lot of information on that. Um, also, you can uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot of native plant gardening books that give some ideas of where plants are suited to. But what I suggest to people is, you know, go to your local nature area and walk around there and see, you know, if you have black sage in your area or if there's a lot of uh, California buckwheat, things like that will give you hints of what to use in your own garden. Um, when thinking about planting your plants alone or in clumps, we recommend putting them in clumps of like three to five of the same type of plant. Again, thinking about how large they're going to grow when they mature, um, but that will help to attract pollinators. They respond better to a group of the same type of flowers. You know, imagine like it, they would be out in a meadow. Um, think about multi-level structure. Sometimes you can put a, um, you know, a ceanothus or a, a manzanita or potentially a toyon, something that's going to have a little bit of height, maybe a lemonade berry and then sort of build an understory around it. And that way, um, you know, you have flowers at different heights in your garden. Uh, seeds, I saw somebody uh, put in a couple of questions here about uh, seeds and um, also noted that our list is mostly perennials and uh, asked about annuals. So a lot of times what you can use seeds and annuals for is to fill in that inner space between your perennials. And especially the first few years before your perennials get larger, you can um, do that. Also, I um, forgot to mention that some pollinators such as our ground nesting native bees like to have bare open ground. So leaving some open uh, ground is a good idea and you can seed your poppies and lupins into those areas. Um, that way they'll come up for a part of the year and then they'll kind of die back. Um, also with perennials, uh, one thing that um, 
some first time native plant gardeners are a little afraid to do is prune back their plants and then they get sort of rangy and uh, sprawl across your pathways and stuff. And I would recommend not, um, not being too shy to, uh, you know, keep your garden looking um, the level of neatness that appeals to you. You can always cut the natives back. And a lot of times they even respond well to that type of um, trimming. Of course, occasionally you'll cut something back too far and it will die, but you know, then you just have to uh, replace it. So, all right, um, what's Jonathan, the next also slide? I think I'm just about done. Um, just real quick, there's a question here about um, cross pollination. So even if uh, people were to use native plants are there any potential risks of cross-pollinating native plants and propagated plants? And I see Mary has um, entered in some thoughts there too, but the question is wondering if um, this could have a negative effect on the genetics of the local population. Well, that's actually a good question for our segue. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> for the most part, um, you know, it doesn't, um, we don't think it would, but it is of course a possibility. And with the with our project that we presented on at CMPS, which is we're spending a lot of time and effort trying to get um, a milkweed to grow for our area that has been collected from our local area, we were sort of worried about that as all the commercially available uh, narrow leaf milkweed was from Northern California. And, um, you know, in addition to it maybe not doing great in our soils and climate, we also wanted to support the local genetics. So that's why we're trying hard right now to get the milkweed collected from the wild and get that wild milkweed into our local nurseries so that we don't have that problem with milkweed, for example. But um, I mean, I would say for the most part in a home garden in an urban setting, you don't really have to worry about that, but it's a good question. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge these uh, local plant nurseries. Um, Musa Creek, Butterfly Farms, and Native West are all great places to get um, native plants locally. Butterfly Farms has both native and non-native, so a wide variety of pollinator plants. And then two seed companies, uh, SNS Seeds and Anderson Seeds, are places where you can get native plant seeds and uh, pollinator mixes. Um, on the 10th and the 24th, we'll go more into detail on prepping your space and planning your garden. Um, and of course, the maintenance of your garden, the watering it, the watching what you got and weeding. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Mary. I'm just gonna tear up with a couple of uh, quick slides on milkweed and monarch, and then she'll go into more detail on that. Next slide. If we need them more slides. Yeah. All right. As you can see, uh, planting native milkweed. Um, we recommend planting native milkweed for monarchs. Uh, historically, the narrow leaf milkweed was from Northern California, but we're trying to establish a local uh, seed source that would be adapted to our local climate. And um, we also want to uh, call attention to the issue with tropical milkweed that. Um, some studies have shown that it has a higher uh, amounts of the uh, poison, the carnitinides, that the causes monarchs not to be palatable, but some say that it is too high in those. Um, another reason that we're encouraging you to plant native milkweed is that because the tropical milkweed can overwinter here, the OE spores can build up on tropical milkweed. So if you do have it in your garden, uh, please cut it back to one to two inches tall in late October, early November. That way those uh, spores will uh, not regenerate. And the third thing is that having the um, tropical milkweed in the wintertime when the monarch butterfly would be naturally overwintering, um, it can potentially um, cause problems with the monarch's migration and potentially keep the butterflies from going into their normal winter behavior. Next slide. All right, now I will hand it over to our partner, Mary Duffy, who's working hard on monarch and milkweed conservation for our San Diego Pollinator Alliance. 
So take it away, Mary. Hi, I'm Mary Duffy. I'm from the um, Earth Discovery Institute, which is a little nonprofit in Southeast uh, San Diego County. Um, we work with the Pollinator Alliance and a lot of other agencies and partnerships to, uh, we do environmental education for youth and we do outreach and conservation events for adults. But also right now we are um, actually um, in the process of farming native milkweed, specifically narrow leaf milkweed, Asclepias fascicularis, um, in, a, in an effort with the Pollinator Alliance to um, grow enough milkweed, native milkweeds that are locally sourced to distribute to growers like you, to people who want to have gardens like you. So um, next slide, slide in. Our, our milkweed farm actually is um, in Lakeside, uh, near Lakeside Downs. Um, we are on some property that's owned by Endangered Habitats Conservancy, and they have gracious, graciously um, allowed us to put a milkweed farm in there, which we just started last year, sort of off the cuff um, with instructions from Jonathan and Ann. Um, we, we got everything going pretty late, but we, what we wanted to do was really see um, what the native milkweed seeds, how they performed in a sort of farming greenhouse situation. So uh, we also gather native milkweed seed in the wild and that's what we use to um, put into our milkweed farm. So the process was purely experimental. I'd never grown milkweed before. I'd only heard anecdotally that it was um, difficult to germinate and difficult to propagate. I don't know so much about whether or not it was difficult to grow, but um, um, we collected a, a, a lot of milkweed seed from the wild and we, we specifically collected narrow leaf milkweed because it seems to be the milkweed that in the county that is most abundant and grows in an area where most people live. In other words, it's not a high altitude milkweed and it's not a desert milkweed. Um, it's, a, it's a milkweed of the coastal sage scrub and in some cases, chaparral communities, and even in like higher in the Cuyamacas and stuff. So um, we decided to use uh, two different sites. I read a lot of the literature that Jonathan sent me about growing milkweed and anecdotally heard from a, a lot of people that they weren't having any success growing um, milkweed, narrow leaf milkweed in San Diego County. They would often buy plants from the native nurseries and it might last a year, but then it wouldn't come back. So we thought there were two, one of two things could have been happening. We've never really um, narrowed it down, but one is that most of the milkweed that was sur um, sourced from the um, seed companies was coming out of mid Northern California, not adapted to the harsher climate of San Diego, California. And the other proposition, which I think is likely the true problem was that the seed was old. Milkweed seeds, if anybody's ever looked at them, are really, really um, not very substantial. You know, it, it takes anywhere from uh, 500 to 800 of them to make up a gram of seed, even though they're, they look big, they're, the, the actual seed part is very small. So um, we collected the milkweed that fall and then planted it that winter. So we used two, two treatments or techniques at two different sites. We had a screen house in Hamul, and we had the site from Endangered Habitats Conservancy in Lakeside. So we had to prepare all that rapidly and get ready to uh, get milkweed in the ground, which we got in the ground very late last year, but we did successfully get it in the ground. In the screen house, we planted it in two inch pots. And at the milkweed farm, we planted it direct to ground. And then we had basically two treatments um, that we um, put the seeds through. First one was, of course, no treatment at all. And then the second one was cold stratification, which is um, a process by which you um, actually take the seed um, in, the, in the middle of winter. What you're doing is you're mimicking winter. You take the seed and you put it in a bag of, um, we used vermiculite. You can use any, anything that will hold water, I mean, hold moisture even sand, um, and put a little bit in there, enough that when you squeeze that substrate, it, no water comes out, just you're dampening it. And then you put your seed in there, you know, a gram of seed or however many seeds you happen to have, and then you put it in the refrigerator. So most refrigerators 
hover around somewhere around 40 degrees and that's what you want. And then you leave it in there. Now, we didn't know specifically how long to leave it in there, but um, uh, most of the papers say leave it in there four to six weeks. I think we left it in there a little bit longer than that. I'm assuming you could leave it in there a shorter period of time or a longer period of time and get the same results. But um, the germination of seeds, both in the greenhouse and direct to ground, that were stratified, cold stratified, they performed much better than seeds that weren't treated at all. So that was one of the things we found out. Um, our germination rates there, I put about 50% germination from untreated seeds. That includes in the greenhouse and in the ground, sort of an average. We actually had a lot more success planting uh, directly to ground and especially planting the seeds directly to ground that have been cold stratified. Um, the, um, we're getting kind of a little slideshow here. That was good. Uh, we also had some transplants that we got from Butterfly Farms, and um, those transplants um, did well, but we had better survival from plants that were grown direct from seed. But um, just to make it clear that a plant transplanted from a pot will do well. They don't like to have their roots handled too much. You have to be kind of careful with them, not as much as you do, say, with Matalia poppy, but um, they don't they don't like a lot of handling. I put this picture in here, the picture on the upper um, left hand corner, because I think a lot of people often say that their milkweed died in the winter. It died. Um, and that's because they're used to growing tropical milkweed, which stays alive all year round, which is a problem for the monarchs. But um, all of our native milkweeds go dormant in the winter. They actually die back. So in a garden setting, I know for a lot of people that doesn't look good, but you can cut down these um, stems, these dried stems, and, and that's what the, the monarchs actually need. They need the, their, um, their host plant to die back in the winter, which encourages them to um, migrate and look for other food sources. And you'll notice right at the base of this um, dead spiky milkweed in the upper left-hand corner there is a little bit of plant material, and that's, that's the milkweed just starting to come up. This year, the, uh, we had that um, warm snap in um, November, December, and the milkweed actually started growing again, and then it died back, and um, our milkweed is coming up again this year. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, these are just some tips um, for growing milkweed that um, we've learned from our uh, successes and failures. Um, we tried to grow milkweed from rhizomes. We did not have any success, but we had so much success growing it from seed that we made that our main plan and put all of our efforts into that because with, with growing plants from seed, any plants from seed, you get that genetic diversity that you really want that will really support the health of the plant in the future. Um, there's many ways to collect seed. You need to collect it only in these ways on private property, but you can also do it in your own setting if you start uh, growing milkweed and that is to put a mesh bag over the seed pods when they develop so that the, the seed has this pappus that blows away if you um, don't put a mesh bag over it. So that mesh bag can also help protect it against some pests, the plant from some pests, but it'll also collect and hold your seed for you, which is really handy. Uh, the other tip, of course, is to cold stratify your seeds before you try to propagate them. Um, best results, if you're gonna grow from seed, is to uh, sow the seeds direct to ground. Another issue that we had in our milkweed farm was um, gophers, everybody's bane in a garden. And um, so all the new plantings we're doing, we're actually putting in root cages. We're not gonna um, plant directly out in the ground. We're gonna root cage our milkweeds just to try to limit the gopher uh, predation. Um, this picture here that you see is actually milkweed that was started last year in March. It grew through the year, went dormant in November, died back completely, and this is what it looks like right now. It's just now starting to come back. Um, a little early this year, but uh, everything's a little early, I think, this year because of those rains and the fact that it's been so warm. Milkweed also needs to be planted in that oxymoron of a, it, it prefers to grow in a place with a lot of sunlight. So it wants moist soils, it has to be irrigated, it needs water, it's not one of those plants that we all look for in Southern California too that's, um, that can handle the arid environment and doesn't need water. You know, all the, thing, all the different species we look for that are um, arid tolerant plants, 
milkweed is not one of them. It, narrow leaf milkweed is not one of them. It needs moisture. It needs to be irrigated. It needs to have water. It likes a light mulch. You can see here, there's just um, wood chips on top of it, but no amendments to the soil at all. That soil is just decomposed granite. We put the light mulch on top just to try to hold some of that moisture in there. And the other trick is to be patient. This time last year, I was sure all the milkweed I had wasn't gonna come up. It hadn't sprouted yet. It hadn't gotten warm, warm enough yet. It hadn't reached 80 degrees at all on any given day. And once it did, um, uh, later than this year, I, I can't remember the exact date, sometime in April, I think, all of a sudden, all of it started sprouting. And um, so uh, patience is um, important when you're trying to grow native milkweeds. If you buy a plant from a nursery and you put it in the ground, it will die back in the fall. That's great. You can cut back all those ugly sticks if you don't like them or leave them there. They'll let you know where your milkweed is and just be patient the next spring and your milkweed, I think, will come back up. Next slide. Um, just yeah. quick before we advance to the next slide, there's a question here in the chat. Okay. Um, it is at, oops, asking if the milkweed, the, the narrow leaf milkweed that um, you can buy at native nursery, native plant nurseries is comparable to what you're growing from the collected seeds. I think presently it pretty much is. I, I know we've given seed to, the Pollinator Alliance has given seed to both Musa Creek and um, Native West as to whether or not that's enough to suffice the need over the course of the year, I don't know. But, but presently, um, yes. I'd say probably, like that, and that is definitely the plan, you know, for hopefully more native plant nurseries in San Diego County to carry the San Diego native milkweed, but currently it's probably pretty likely that you would get milkweed from other parts of the state as well at native plant nurseries. And so as Mary was saying, you know, that, or, and Jonathan earlier too, it may not be as robust as seed that was collected here and that is adapted to our conditions or that is very fresh, you know, there, there's that question too. And yes, CMPS does carry local milkweed seeds. The seeds they sell now, I think they're trying to just specifically sell seeds that are locally sourced. There's not a lot to go around. So that's, that's why we're trying to create the seed bank. Once this milkweed farm gets going, we're hoping it's a really robust seed bank to provide locally sourced native seeds to um, people like you in San Diego County. Um, next slide. I'm just going to go over these uh, pests real quick and I'll deal with it more next week. But of course, um, all plants have their pests and milkweed seems to have lots of pollinators and lots of pests for a plant that's supposedly toxic and doesn't taste good. It's pretty amazing um, the amount of activity it has on it. And so there's aphids, there's small milkweed bugs, there's large milkweed bugs, which is what the picture is of both, both of the these are uh, the ones on the left of the larval stage of the small milkweed bugs. The one on the, the um, upper right is an adult large milkweed bugs. I don't see very many small milkweed bugs in San Diego County. It has more of a red X. You notice that red and orange uh, uh, warning coloration is the same as a monarch. That's because that insect is also as toxic as a monarch. So birds and stuff won't eat it after they've tried one. Um, and aphids, you can see down there, are always a problem. But I'm surprised at how well monarch, uh, milkweed tolerates all these pests. It's a, really an amazing plant. Um, somebody was talking about root fungus. I think you always have to remember when you're talking about fungus that most fungus you see, even in your compost, is good fungus. And it's um, that white stuff you see, that thready white stuff you often see, is mycelium. It's actually, it's actually the fungal body. Um, the, the mushroom is the, is the fruit, but the actual fungus is that white stuff you see. And most of it is good. Very, um, a root rot is something more in San Diego I worry about where you're over watering, especially in a nursery setting. Sometimes it'll get in your pots and stuff like that. But it's not such a big problem because we have such a dry climate and in well-drained uh, DG soils is not as um, big of a problem. I do, there, I do know there's some rust funguses and things like that. Those are usually the result of um, either amendments that you put in the soil that, or uh, different kinds of wood chippings and stuff like that that you may wish you didn't put in there or too much water. Um, and I'm, I'm, I don't have any solid way of dealing with those because if you start dealing with rust funguses, you're gonna also kill all the good mycelium too. 
So it's that catch 22 kind of thing. Um, and then I wrote on here gophers. We can talk more about gophers next time, but um, gophers can be a big problem as everybody knows. Um, they can cause a lot of destruction to gardens. If you've, if you've got a small enough space, you can keep them out of there with just black hole traps or Maccabee traps or, or some other way. There's a multitude of ways to, uh, to keep gophers out. We've, we've decided just to make giant root cages, which is what you see down there in the uh, lower left. Um, and, and we'll see this year if that works. I've actually noticed that picture I showed you pre previously of what our milkweeds look like this year. A lot of our milkweed that was, had the gophers run through the garden is still coming up in between uh, all the soil the, mon mon uh, the gophers have turned up. So um, it's not taking out all of the milkweed. It might actually even be, sometimes you know gophers can actually even enhance soil by turning it over and um, we're gonna let that go and see how it goes. And we're just hoping for a good, we're hoping our plants flower and um, go to fruit this year. And we actually get some seed for the first time. I think there's another thing we've noticed about our farm in Lakeside where we, we planted it and started it is when we were planting last year, um, we didn't have a lot of pollinators. A lot of pollinators there yet. So um, we're hoping this year to see an increase in pollinators. And what we're going to start doing is planting more um, pollinator attracting plants around and within our milkweed um, garden, our milkweed farm, to try to increase the number of pollinators there. Any, anybody who grows narrow leaf milkweed in um, at least in East County, I'm sure any place else, will notice that the number one pollinator is Pepsis wasp, the tarantula hawk. And you, those can kind of be intimidating, but um, actually when they're, when they're nectaring, when they're feeding, they won't bother you. I'm out in them all the time. Um, if it got caught in my clothes or something like that, it might be an issue, but otherwise they won't bother you at all. And one of my greatest joys about growing milkweed is the number of different insects I see that, that utilize this plant. It's astonishing. There's a picture I showed earlier of uh, Crotch's bumblebee, which is a bumblebee that's on the um, endangered species list in the state of California. And it's exciting to know that we have it down here and that it nectars in on, um, on narrow leaf milkweed. And next, yeah. I think that's turning it over to Jonathan Rand. Okay, so there is actually just one more question for you, Mary, I think, um, from Christina, who is cold stratifying for the first time. She wants to know how she'll know when the seeds are ready, will they look a certain way, and is it disruptive to the growth of the seeds if she opens the bag in the fridge to check on their progress? No, and nothing will happen as long as they're in the bag. They will, they will maintain exactly, looking exactly the same until you plant them in the soil and they decide to germinate, and that will take it it, they won't germinate until they get up to about 80 degrees. So you don't try to pick them out of the um, vermiculite or perlite or where, whatever you put them in sand. You you actually plant that material with the seeds. You um, you don't try to pick them out or anything like that. You don't have to look at them. I would say any time now, March 1st on, you can you can put them in a pot or in the ground. And then you just Thank have you. to be patient. patience. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, just quickly to loop back to this notion that we can all do something to help monarchs and other pollinators. Um, we've been talking about planting nectar sources, planting native plants, and getting started now. So I want to reiterate, anything that we do to help monarchs or any other pollinator is going to help the other pollinators in your garden and other wildlife too. There's also some, some really great community science efforts going on out there and some big research gaps to fill. So we really invite you to participate in some of these community science efforts, particularly monitoring monarchs and milkweed throughout the year. But it really, I think of interest um, is during the winter when they should be overwintering, but here in San Diego and maybe other parts of Southern California, they're not. So putting any recordings of your observations of milk, milkweed or monarchs um, this time of year and all year round into the Xerces Society Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper will be really uh, helpful. That's contributing to, you know, science learning from across the whole region, this is the state and the whole West. So please participate if you can. And just a couple of updates on 
things that are coming next. Um, Jonathan mentioned, but um, here's a place to reiterate, the next workshops in this series are on March 10th and March 24th at 4 p.m. Um, we updated the original registration form to include those dates. So we'll pop that in the chat so that you can sign up if you would like to the next workshops. And I'll be sure to make sure that the Zoom link uh, correlates to the correct start time and those ones. Um, we're also inviting people to get involved in some of the other efforts that are going on. We have a few different uh, pollinator habitat projects that could use some volunteers. If you're interested in that, there's also a place to check on the registration form and we'll be putting out some more information about that. And we're trying to set up a system where um, we can have garden mentors help less experienced garter, gardeners to work together to create pollinator habitats. So if you'd like to sign up to be a mentor or receive assistance from a mentor, that registration form also has a plate, boxes to check for that. So let me see if I can just, I don't know, Jonathan, oops. Jonathan, would you be able to stick that link in the chat? Or I can in just a moment. <clears throat> I can that, do that is great. Thank you. Um, and I think we wanted to take some time to um, to just to do some more question and answer. If people have questions, they can unmute themselves and ask or put more questions in the box or the chat box. But we also wanted to acknowledge the organizations and agencies that support this work, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the San Diego National Wildlife Refuge, the Wildlife Conservation Board um, through a grant um, via the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts, the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program that Jonathan works with, and the Milk Nature Fund. So thank you to all of them, and also to Mary and Jonathan for many of the beautiful pictures in this presentation. These are our contact details. Feel free to reach out to any of us with any questions at any time. Um, if, you, if something pops into your head you know, after this workshop, we'd be happy to answer questions later too. Okay, wow, so somebody saw a monarch in their yard today. That is exciting. Um, and thanks Morgan for entering in that milkweed mapper link. Yeah, please do register for the workshop so we know who to send the, um, the, the, the Zoom link to. That would be really helpful. And uh, yeah, we hope the monarch will be higher this year too. We're going to try to get the, um, I mean, we'll do a little bit of review and, um, you know, if anybody wants to uh, share their map, um, you can email it to me or to Anne um, and we can uh, incorporate it into some of our uh, review slides for the first uh, 10 or 15 minutes um, next time. Um, We also had uh, put a call out to the um, folks at the Native Plant Society to see um, who would like to uh, link up with um, novice gardeners. And I see Dee asked a question about that. Um, did we get any um, people who said that they would want to do that, Anne? Yeah, we do have a couple of people, but um, we'll try to round up some more. I know we have, you know, so, our county so big, so it'd be nice to have some, you know, some additional people to help. Yeah, so if you'd specifically like to be paired up with someone, like uh, Dee mentioned, please send Anne a specific email um, indicating that or re-register, uh, re I think, on that uh, form. It does ask sort of a question about that, but um, that way we could have your... Um, details D to pass on to one of our more experienced gardeners. I'm sure probably everyone would like a mentor. So if you do just uh, make sure you're clear in probably the subject line of your email um, and we will try to work that out. We haven't done that before. So it would be kind of a, uh, a uh, trial run there, but uh, you know, there are a lot of people who are real knowledgeable who love sharing their information their uh, expertise. I guess we yeah, can go um, ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to let everyone know, I'll send a follow-up email probably tomorrow to everybody who signed up for today's workshop with that link for registering for the next two workshops too, and the mentor-mentee 
um, arrangement. So in case anybody misses grabbing that link now, I'll follow up with it. Uh, let's go ahead and stop sharing the screen and then just see if anybody uh, feels like they want to you know, turn on their video or their audio and ask a question. Um, and we'll probably uh, stay on for the next 10 minutes here. But if anybody wanted to uh, just have a little bit more informal uh, Q&A. And probably will. Um, uh, yeah. Just to, to let you all know, um, and Mary, I see your question there. These, it, there's no prerequisite to attend one workshop to attend another. Um, we'll share the same resources with everybody who um, didn't attend the first workshop so they can kind of catch up. But yeah, it's not, um, you know, attending one isn't dependent on attending another. All right, I think Christina has a question. And then if you have a question, just uh, click on the raise your hand button. But go ahead, Christina. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't, I don't, okay. Oh, um, no worries. You're first in line. Go yeah, ahead. Sure, if I, that on my, um, um, I just want to commend the work that you're doing. You guys are so inspiring. Um, all these groups that have come together. Mary, you're a goddess with those seeds. You've, you've really helped uh, mentor us over here in Rebelinda. Um, we're really trying to create a movement and we just want to like clone whatever you've done in San Diego and, and move it over to Orange County. Um, and I just wanted to let you know if there's anything that our group can do um, to advance. I don't know if you guys have started thinking along those lines. I, I know it's always good to start small, but maybe I'm just being naive and maybe there is something already in the works, but we'll support, we'll do what we can. Um, but we love how organized you are and just how you're pulling all your resources together to mentor really a, a big city um, of gardeners. So we need that here in Orange County. We're just all loosely like flailing about. And so my members, my teammates are here today because we're like, we got to, we got to go listen. We got to hear what they're doing down there. So thank you. Well, that's nice of you to say, Christina. Um, you know, we certainly started out small like you guys did too, just finding, um, different uh, landowners that would let us do gardens on their property and you know slowly we built up our knowledge base and our partners base and I mean we we're pretty excited this last year to have the um, zoo and the um, natural history museum come on board as partners so uh, you know little by little and and you know maybe connecting with people like at Cal State San, uh, Fullerton or um, you know they have a nice botanical garden there um, or the Irvine uh, Ranch Conservancy, they have a nice uh, seed farm. And I know that they are trying to conserve pollinators on their property and starting to think about milkweed. So that might be two um, places that you'd like to get in contact with people, Christina. But um, if you have trouble getting in touch with either of those groups, uh, send me a note. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Sue, did you have a question? Uh, you're on mute if you want to unmute yourself. Sue? Uh, Sue, you're on mute. Uh, I'm on Christina's um, team. And again, you guys have taught us so much and given us some real vision for you know what one can do. Well, you. you guys keep up the good work up there in Orange County. You certainly uh, have a long history of having orange groves and agriculture. And so starting a history of doing pollinator gardening is certainly within your, your reach. So yep. good job, you guys. Thank you. If anybody else had any general comments or... Uh, uh, any, I know we have several other knowledgeable people, um, Jennifer Galay, uh, Galley, sorry, uh, G. John, um, Pat is with us. So, you know, if anybody has any um, information. I also, uh, uh, Morgan is one of our interns and she's working on a pollinator guide. Um, I was going to, let's see, I wonder if I can share my screen. Let me just make that. 
There you go. All right. Is, can you guys see this, uh, my uh, PDF browser there? Not yet. Oh, not yet. Can you see any of my? Two, I can share it. I have the capabilities as well. All right. Oh, cool. Um, okay. All right. Apparently, that is beyond my Zoom capabilities. Morgan, if you can bring it up, give it a try too. Well, while we're waiting for that to come up, this this is John Hazard. J. John, um, uh, I work with with Jonathan in in the Carlsbad Fish and Wildlife Office. Good good presentation, guys. Thank you. Um, I wanted to mention that one of the things that that I think Jonathan said was was going out into your your local area and um, seeing what what grows in your local area. Going to the natural areas and, and, and maybe finding a nature trail that has signs that have uh, identified plants. But sometimes you don't have those signs and you know quite what you're looking at. Um, there, there are, um, you can take pictures of, of what, what you're looking at and, and load it up into iNaturalist or I think there's a couple of other programs that might work the same way. And um, iNaturalist will actually uh, have have a way to to identify the plants if you get a, a good enough picture and, and some of it's done uh, through through artificial intelligence it's it's pretty slick and then you get get verification by other observers as to what the, what the plant's identification is and so that that is a, if you don't have a way to to uh, find a plant guide or key it out or figure out how to identify the, the plants yourself. Um, uh, that that's one one tool available. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, thanks, Jijun. Um If you uh, can put the link for that in the in the chat, but yeah, definitely we're lucky to have a lot of tools uh, to help us these days. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to share this document that uh, Morgan is working on for us, and so we hope to have this. Um, guide. I was just kind of paging through it so you guys could kind of see what is involved there. Um, but we're hoping to have this pollinator toolkit done uh, by the end of the workshops a month from now. So hopefully that's something that then you could use as a um, as a take home. But you know, we've made some of the worksheets available for you. And uh, if you have any feedback on any of this stuff, certainly let us know. Or if you have uh, questions that you'd like to have specifically answered on the um, one of the next two workshops, uh, please send us um, an email. You can send that to either myself or to Anne. But uh, we appreciate you guys spending your Wednesday afternoon with us. Uh, Aunt, uh, Mary, do you have anything else that you'd like to say in signing off? I was just going to answer um, Monica's question real quick, um, but we'll go into detail more on that next time probably, and that's how to handle um, pests like aphids or milkweed bugs in your garden. Um, always an issue. Um, because we're trying to support native pollinators, we can't use any pesticides or chemicals to try to remove those other insects, which are actually beneficial in their own, you know, different ways as food sources. So the, the number one way we remove um, um, insects is by hand manually, especially aphids. And we'll never get rid of all the aphids, but we just try to keep the population down. Uh, people do recommend sometimes just hosing them off, but then I read somewhere that that can also hose off um, small caterpillars, monarch larvae, or even the eggs. So it's, it's not recommended by people who are trying to um, protect the monarchs. But if you've got a pair of gloves, you can just squeeze them off gently and kind of flick them off. You can just work at them. And like I said, you'll never get them all off. If you've got ants tending them, they'll constantly be back. But you can keep the population down low enough that it won't hurt the plants. When I notice it causes the most damage is when the aphids are actually, when the plant's about to go to flower and the aphids are up there on the flower head and then they suck all the juices out of the flower head before they can um, 
develop seed pods and then you won't get seed pods. But otherwise they are, they're there and they just add to the biodiversity of the plant, of that habitat. Well, thanks for sharing all your knowledge, Mary. We sure appreciate you sharing all this information. Um, Anne, uh, do you wanna go ahead and sign us off? Yeah, Everybody, sure. Thank well, you, thanks everybody. everyone so much. Yeah, thanks for being here. And we'll see anyone who wants to join us on the 10th. I'll send out that link so you can sign up and so that we can be sure to share the Zoom link with you. Have a good rest thanks of so your day. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, Morgan. See you, David. Thank you. And Christina. Thank you. Thanks for attending, Gijon. Yeah, thank you, everyone.